this is topographical data. You might be wondering, what does this area look like now? Nowadays, everybody thinks of Google Maps, so let's look at this area with Google Maps. This is the satellite image of the area. Can you see the channel? What should we call this? A channel or a river? In case you are having trouble seeing the edges of this ancient river, in the next image, I've colored it for you. I don't know about you, but I find this amazing. When I was searching in Google Maps, I found two different sets of images. Let me show you the other set. I decided to color the image as well. Let's zoom in further on one segment of this giant river. In this image, I decided to include Google's Maps scale. Notice how big the river is. That is amazing. At a minimum, it was three miles wide. In some areas, it was 10 miles wide. This was a short and shallow river. It was a massive river. In case you want to find this ancient riverbed using coordinates, here they are. The distance between these two points is roughly 135 miles. When the southern flank of Lake Chad collapsed, this river stopped flowing. It will never flow again. However, do not underestimate this river's importance. This ancient riverbed proves that Lake Chad was this high at one point. It proves that Lake Chad flowed east at one point. It proves Lake Chad was once the head of the Nile River. Paleontologists constantly debate how early humans migrated out of Africa the first time. This ancient riverbed completely changes this debate. Again, Lake Chad once was this big. It flowed to the southwest to the Gulf of Guinea. At this time, nobody knows the cause. For some reason, this southern flank failed and it collapsed. Perhaps this was a simple case of erosion. Over time, monsoon rains may have eroded the southern mountain range. Perhaps the southern flank was weak. Maybe this was not a mountain range made of hard rock. Maybe it was made of softer sedimentary rock. Perhaps, as this image shows, a river flowed through it. And over time, the river simply eroded a channel. Perhaps, as the massive lake filled, the force of the water was simply too great. Perhaps a large earthquake triggered the collapse. The way I envision the cause of the collapse is, it was all of the above. The southern flank was made of softer material. The massive lake created a tremendous force pushing against the southern rim of the Lake Chad Basin. Erosion from the monsoon rains, the same rains that filled the lake, washed away a channel for a stream. This stream grew into a river. Over time, the river grew until a tipping point was reached. Maybe the trigger was an earthquake. Maybe the monsoon rain simply filled the lake to a record height. Whatever was the trigger, the southern flank collapsed. The record of this massive flood exists to this day. It gouged out a huge trough. This trough is called the Banu Trough. In this graphic, I've drawn some red lines. These lines are roughly drawn directly over huge scrapes in the trough. These channels, these scrapes, flow towards the sea. The direction of these scrapes is the wrong direction for erosion. Erosion from river would flow downhill towards the bottom of the channel. These scrapes lie at a 90 degree angle to the normal erosion patterns. The evidence is obvious. If geologists check the rock along the Banu Trough, I am sure they'll find evidence of this scraping created by this massive collapse. Someday I'd love to go to Nigeria and see the evidence for this myself. However, at this time, I don't need to go. After all, you can see the evidence from space. 
The Benu River now flows to the Niger River. Together, the waters from these two rivers flow into the Gulf of Guinea. The Niger River flows out into the Niger Delta. This delta is one of the largest deltas in the world. This delta is unusually large. The water of the Niger River system is very clear. Hardly any sediment flows out of this clean river system. That's contradictory. How can you have this huge, huge delta, unnaturally large, made by very clean water. The proof of the massive landslides and the Lake Chad floods lays at the bottom of the massive Niger Delta. You see, it is easy to research this because the Niger Delta has a lot of oil in it. Oil exploration has created a tremendous body of scientific knowledge on this Delta. The oil companies have extensively studied this Delta. With regard to the science, their studies are impartial. They were looking for oil, not for massive landslides or floods. Let me just say this. There's no doubt a massive collapse of the southern flank of Mega Lake Chad happened. At the bottom of the Niger Delta, the ocean bottom has many layers of sediment from massive landslides and flooding events. The massive quantity of material is simply hard to describe and hard to imagine. It spreads out for hundreds of miles. The first and the largest landslide and flood left a thick layer of material on the bottom of the ocean. It spreads out three to 400 kilometers from shore. The profile of this thick layer of material has gigantic folds and waves. These gigantic folds indicate this bottom layer was deposited rapidly, not slowly. It looks like this thick layer of material was laid down very fast. It is amazingly thick. This layer is 10 to 25 kilometers thick. Imagine being in a helicopter above this when it happened. The first collapse, which was the largest, must have created gigantic tsunamis. They must have been some of the world's largest tsunamis. In addition, after the first collapse, there is evidence for additional smaller collapses. Apparently, each time Lake Chad refilled as high as possible, its southern flank collapsed again and again and again. It appears there were at least five or six major collapses. Each major landslide and flood gouged out the Banu Trough more. They each made this trough bigger and made the Niger Delta thicker. I would love to go over the evidence in detail, however, there's not enough time. Before I finish talking about Africa, I would like to mention two other locations. They come, they come into play when you consider trying to green Africa. In this graphic, there is a lake in the upper right. Is located north of the Darfur conflict region in Sudan. At this time, this area of the desert is completely dry. If you were standing in this high desert depression, you would never know that it once contained a massive ancient lake. Personally, I would like to see doags placed around the outer edge of this basin and gradually refill this lake. Here's a better image to show this ancient lake's shorelines. Ancient African megalakes and megafloods were not uncommon. This is an image of northern Africa's topography. It is also part of the data from the shuttle radar topography mission. Just like in earlier images, I've compressed the colors. Notice the obvious dark red basin. This was the location of another African megalake. Researchers have named this ancient lake Chots. Researchers have studied this lake. There's no doubt this depression once was a massive lake. The fossil evidence proves it. Its ancient shorelines are still obvious in the desert sands. There's um, ancient shells 
that used to be on the lake's bottom. Another ancient northern African mega lake lies to the east. Its basin is a little harder to see. It has been named Fazan. Of course, Chotz doesn't exist anymore. Further, this basin will never refill. On its northern flank, there is a massive gorge. This gorge lies west of a town called Gabes. This gorge formed when this natural dam collapsed. The mega lake Chotz flooded into the Mediterranean Sea, into the Gulf of Gabes. This was a massive flood. Evidence of this flood is obvious. The lake's basin, the gorge, the remnant lakes, the underground aquifer, perhaps the most interesting detail, lies on the bottom of the Mediterranean. Between the Gulf of Gabes and Sicily, the Mediterranean is very shallow. Maybe this has always been the case. Maybe the bottom of the Mediterranean in this area is covered with sediment from this flooding event. As you can see, I find this entire topic very interesting. The history of Lake Chad is extremely interesting. It pulls you in. You start researching the history of Africa's geology, how the wind patterns now blow over Africa, how they once blew, how the monsoon rains can vary over time, how long-term climate cycles can transform the dry Sahara into a wet green Sahara. Again, I've had to delete large amounts of information to save time, but now I must move on. Yes, the Sahara is now a desert. However, it is wrong to think of the Sahara as a desert. Instead, think of the Sahara as a region. Sometimes this region is wet, lush, and green. Sometimes it is a desert. It's very interesting to study how the earth wobbles because this changing wobble is what causes the repeating climate cycle in Africa. The cycle repeats itself roughly every 20,000 years. 